Bob asked me to talk about unusual cases of viral CNS disease. You might have heard of um, some of these uh, in the last months. And I told him, I can try. Um, I can certainly present the case that I was most involved in. And I can try to um, describe what I know about other, other cases and, and try to, to see what's similar and what's different. So I'll go through my case, and then we'll touch a little bit on other, um, other types of diseases. So this case, the, I'll go through the clinical presentation. First we know is on Saturday, there is lethargy and thumping in one room of one nursery. Um, and aspirin is given. On Wednesday, that same room, 29 pigs down, can't walk, purple extremities, HPS-like lesions and necropsy. They are given Batril. Doesn't seem to work very well. And then in 10-week-old pigs that are already in the finisher, um, on, on the same day on Wednesday, but that come from that same, uh, that same nursery, uh, we have 0.5% of CNS and 80% of thumping. When the necropsies are done, there's only moderate bronchopneumonia. And all, again, they are, they are being given Batril. The next day, in the um, original group, in the eight week old pigs, there's 3% mortality in 24 hours, 1% um, uh, showing CNS signs at the time that the vet was there, and all of them are thumping and gaunt. Um, at the necropsy, there is moderate bronchopneumonia, and five pigs from this group are sent to the VDL. And then same day, at a different finisher, same source, there's 8% that are gaunt thumping, 2% CNS, 2% purple extremities, some swollen eyelids, um, and then at necropsy, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of different things, embolic pneumonia, pleuropneumonia, colitis, and from this group, three pigs are sent to the BDL. Um, next Monday, mortality reaches more than 20% in, um, in the very first group, in the eight-week-old pigs. That by, by this time, they are nine-week-old, and mortality reaches uh, 20%. So at this point, there were a number of differentials. Um, there was a question about cell toxicity at the very beginning because of the way it started. It started in one room only. Um, as this thing developed, this, um, this differential kind of went down the, the list. Uh, bad strep suis, uh, definitely an option. Um, edema disease, we considered. Salmonellosis, maybe because of those lesions in the colon that we saw, it was in, in our list. A bad parasuis, uh, PERS with secondary. This is a system that is positive for PERS, and, but, but usually they have a pretty good control of what um, PERS strains they have. So those were all differentials. And the, the results start coming up. And this is just an example of what we found in three different pigs. Remember, we had eight pigs. But just so you get an idea, we get a number of isolates, different isolates from different, um, from different uh, tissues. Only one pig had parasuis in the brain. Every, you know, all the other five pigs, no, we didn't grow anything from the brains. So really nothing consistent and nothing really from the brain that I thought it could be relevant. Um, maybe that parasitic but it was only one out of six. So that, that was a little, um, that was not, not very helpful. At least um, I thought we could rule some out uh, from that. And then we got the histopathology. And what we found was a moderate to mark non-superative encephalitis or meningoencephalitis in all of the pigs, six out of six that we had brain. Um, you, you see sometimes a, a mild encephalitis, but, but this was uh, to a severity that we usually don't see. At the same time, we had a marked interstitial pneumonia uh, in all of the pigs, very severe, characteristic of PERS virus, but even, even more severe than what we used to see. So uh, this is the kind of lesions that we're seeing in the brain, so there is um, inflammation around the blood vessels. And like I said, you usually uh, when you have a, uh, an encephalitis, you would see some of it, but not to this degree. Here there's a lot more. So uh, you didn't have to, you don't have to look for it very carefully. It was right there in the, uh, in the cerebrum. The cerebellum was pretty, uh, pretty normal. Um, the brainstem was pretty normal. The, 
the cortex of the cerebrum was uh, more affected. Um, and in more detail, uh, this is what we saw. So a lot of perivascular inflammation. Some, in some cases, it looked like, like there was a vasculitis as well. Um, some fossa of necrosis as well. And uh, it didn't take me very long to take these pictures because there were examples of this everywhere in the six peaks that we had. So at this point, differential diagnosis, um, I'm, I'm seeing this, and, and this is telling me really that we have a viral problem, we have a viral encephalitis. So um, what viruses can cause a, an encephalitis? Well, I'm thinking, is this a Tesha virus? Um, is this PERS virus? I definitely think that those lesions in the lung are PERS, but I've never seen an encephalitis like this with PERS, but it, I'll put it up there. We'll test for Circo, for HEV, there are a number of viruses um, that have been described to cause encephalitis in pigs. So, you know, you have them up uh, there in your differentials, but uh, most of these you, you hope that, um, that it's not the case and you don't have to deal with, deal with those. Next thing that comes up is the PCR results, and we have first positive results with CTs um, between 17 and 18 in the tissue homogenates that we make at the lab. I didn't put brains in this tissue homogenate, so the brain is not represented there. And, and, I, and I expected um, to have a positive purse based on the lesions. Um, so, and again, uh, eight out of eight, very low CTs. And it's negative for circle, negative for, uh, well, negative for PCB2, negative for uh, another PCR that we have that would pick up also PCB1. It's negative for uh, PCR that we have for pe pestiviruses, negative for HEV. So this is pointing a little bit more to PERS, but, but still um, some results are missing. Eventually we get VI results and uh, we get PERS positive um, on tissue homogenates by VI. Uh, very um, cytopathic uh, strain of virus and negative for circovirus, pestivirus, PRV, and enterovirus. So at this point, I'm thinking PERS encephalitis. It is very severe in this case, but hey, um, I think that's what it may be. Um, so is that, is that something that has been described before? Yeah, it's been described. Uh, Dr. Rosso described in, in the review on the bed pathology back in 1998 um, as um, an, a less common microscopic lesion of PERS virus. And like I said, we, we see it on occasion, but not, not, to this, not in, with this severity. Um, in 99, Dr. Rosso again um, described a case of severe meningoencephalitis associated with PERS virus, but that was in neonatal pigs, so it was a little different. Um, more recently, the, the instances in which I have seen severe CNS disease and encephalitis associated with uh, PERS virus is uh, with the... Um, with the um, high fever um, outbreaks uh, reported in China between, you know, starting in 2006. So, so here is, in, with the viruses that we've, been, um, that we've been seeing in the last years in the U.S. that we don't really know very well where they are coming from, I started getting a little bit scared about this. Um, of course, we had sequencing going on, um, and I was, I was a little bit afraid that we were, going, we were dealing with with this guy here, with the, the Chinese high fever virus. Um, so what did I do to try to convince my help, myself that, that PERS is the problem, or, or what are other diagnostics that, that we did? Oops, okay. So I did PCR on brain, and I got positives with CTs between 16 to 21 in all of them, so very low, very low um, CTs, very high positives, again, in the PCR from brain. Um, I did immunohistochemistry in brain, and they were all positive, and it's not very, I'll show you some pictures later, um, it's, it's not all that easy to find positive staining uh, for person brain, and, and you'll see that it was very evident in these cases. I got a second opinion, um, and, and this is the response that I got. I'd never seen anything like that, and that was from Dr. Rosso. That's the first time that I get that answer from Dr. Rosso. And if Dr. Rosso says that she's never seen anything like that, I get a little nervous. And, and she meant with a, with a PERS infection. Um, but uh, but it, didn't, it didn't seem like I was missing anything. Uh, 
And then we did the R5 sequencing. And we got a virus with an RFLP of 184, 95% homology with a previous virus, previous 184 from the system, and um, it was definitely not the Chinese high, high fever purse virus. So that's good, but definitely the, the, the 184 that they had previously in this system um, was not, was not uh, behaving like this virus. So we culture for enteroviruses. Um, we did virus isolation, but I wanted to make sure we were not missing this one. I sent one sample to ISU. At this point, I was starting to, uh, uh, with all this testing, I was starting to uh, be short on uh, brain samples that I saved. So we tested only one sample, um, and at that at that time we didn't uh, we didn't test for it at the uh, at the Minnesota lab. We have a PCR now in our lab, but they found it negative for Tesho virus at ASU. Their PCR also tests for Sapelovirus and Enterovirus, and those were positive. Um, and I checked with them, and they said, "Yeah, we, that happens um, on occasion." And they, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the interpretation of that. Um, is a little bit um, difficult. But at this point, I was um, interested in ruling out Tesho virus, and, and the PCR was negative. And then what we did is we did next generation sequencing. We did it in house, and we sent samples also to KSU. And all we found in those brain samples, and all KSU found in those brain samples, was uh, PERS virus, a lot of reads, so a high amount of virus in that, in that brain. Um, and we could, act, we, we could actually put together the whole genome of this, of this PERS virus. These are some of the uh, immunohistochemistry um, pictures of what, what I was seeing. And like I said, you know, very, very obvious, very easy to see. Uh, some fossae of necrosis or gliosis and also perivascular. Some of them seem to be associated with the, with the um, endothelium. So at this point, I think I'm dealing with a highly patho pathogenic 184 PERS virus that causes CNS disease in a, in a, certain, per a certain percentage of pigs. Um, the affected nurseries and finishers close with between 30 and 75% mortality. So this was a very, very big problem in this system. Fortunately, they could um, get it contained to uh, a small number of uh, nurseries and finishers one sow farm got infected with this strain, and in the sow farm, it didn't seem to act uh, more uh, severe than other PERS viruses. But when it infected the, the uh, nurseries and finishers, it was really, uh, really bad. Like I said, we got the whole genome from that um, virus. We, uh, we, we aligned it, we put it together, and we found that um, it was 99.9% .9 homologous to a virus from a, from a neighbor that was kind enough to, to give us, and we also put together the whole genome. This is um, one investigation that we did. We, we thought it was coming from that neighbor, um, but the R5 was very, very similar, so we did the whole genome. But the problem is that in the neighboring system, it's not acting this severe. And, and to this point, we don't understand very well why that is. And we don't know. If our first impression was like, well, being, this being PERS virus and that it changes so much, this is really the same virus, a small variation of the same virus. Um, but we should also consider if this 0.1% difference really is doing something to the virus um, that, that we don't understand quite yet, that is uh, accounting for that difference in severity. So. Um, we didn't get the final answer from that uh, investigation, but we're still working on it. And then we did a PERS virus, PERS virus experimental inoculation with this virus. And what we did is we compared it to an older 184. So we did it side by side. And um, Pearl here was in charge of that study. And basically what we found is that um, we found the, the uh, very um, severe depression uh, some uh, respiratory signs. We didn't reproduce the CNS signs, but again, this was a, a small study. And um, we did uh, see more severe clinical signs, more virus, more lesions, 
than a traditional uh, or an older 184 press strain. So that's what I found in, in my case. Um, again, it wasn't in my, it wasn't on the top of my list of differentials or in the veterinarian's uh, top of list, list of differentials when we first saw this. So I think it's uh, good to recognize that, that we can have this type of situation with PERS virus, with what, what we think was an outbreak of PERS virus and, and nothing else. Um, and in the last months, like I said, you might have been hearing about other cases. And I've uh, definitely heard, but I haven't had any cases myself, of a highly pathogenic 134 PERS virus that causes CNS signs. And um, what I've heard, it sounds very, very similar to what we have seen in this uh, previous case. Um, we have seen some porcine test virus in infections. We'll talk uh, about this in, in a minute. Uh, we have seen cases of viral encephalitis associated with sapelovirus, and we have uh, heard about this atypical porcine pestivirus. And when you hear about all these new or recent cases, it can get a little bit confusing. So it is confusing for me too, so I tried to put together a one slide summary of what we know of this, and, and uh, feel free to share also your experiences because some of you might have uh, a more direct experience with some of this. So for Tesho virus, porcine Tesho virus was, was previously called porcine enterovirus, um, some of the serotypes, one through seven and 11 through 13. They got reclassified as Tesho virus and um, is the Tessian and the Talfan. It uh, causes ataxia, paresis, paralysis. It's more a spinal cord disease than it is a brain disease, but it can cause encephalitis. Um, so less commonly would cause uh, convulsions, nystagmus, opistotenus, and coma. The microscopic lesions, again, it's more uh, common to see them in the uh, spinal cord, but it's a polioencephalomyelitis and it can uh, affect the brainstem and the cerebellum, and less frequently the, the, um, the uh, cerebrum. We have occasional cases in the US. We've had them. I think we've always had them. Um, I think when we see that uh, spinal cord viral lesion, um, even if we cannot isolate it by virus isolation, uh, we assume that we were dealing with a case of Tesho virus. Uh, now we have a PCR, and other labs have PCRs for Tesha virus, so um, I expect that we will be detecting uh, more of this and, and actually um, calling them uh, Tesha virus. But what I'm not sure is if there is an increased frequency in the last year or so or, or not. And we're trying to monitor that with the Swine Health product, uh, Monitoring uh, Project. Um, we, we, we kind of have to uh, get all the labs together and find a common um, definition of what's a Tesho virus case, um, but we're working on that. But again, it is true that we've had some recent cases. Um, I don't know that we can say that there is an increased frequency. Now, the porcine sapelovirus, this one, it was also previously called enterovirus. This was a serotype 8 enterovirus, and when they reclassify them, um, it got given a, a, different, um, a different genus, sapelovirus, and it may cause CNS signs and polyencephalomyelitis, and actually there are four reports of uh, CNS disease associated with this virus, and I say associated because some show a stronger association than others. But um, back uh, from a, a case in 1982, when this was still considered serotype 8, to more recent cases in China, in the UK, and the case that you might have heard of recently that Dr. Arruda from ISU described recently um, in pigs in Iowa, and um, that uh, got uh, published through ASV and, and SHIC, and I think all the information or the report is available in the SHIC website. In this particular case, like I said, um, there's, a, there's a more extensive uh, report, but basically it happened in 11 week old pigs. The, the, the clinical picture was ataxia and coordination, paresis and paralysis, and uh, morbidity, morbidity was 20%, case fatality 30%. And um, the, the lesions that, um, that they described and the pictures that are available in that report are very similar to what I just showed you. So it was a 
viral encephalitis, viral encephalitis encephalomyelitis actually, um, very similar to what I just showed you. And um, in that particular case, there was no PERS, there was nothing else. Um, again, uh, next generation sequencing was done in two laboratories in Minnesota and in Kansas State, um, I believe also in Iowa State, and, and we all found only sapelovirus. So, some evidence that sapelovirus can cause also this, um, this picture. Again, increased frequency in the last year. This is the only case that I know about, um, but there's been, you know, a lot of information about this case, so I, I don't know that we can see that, or I don't think that we can see that there is increased frequency. Now we have better tools to uh, test for it and to monitor it, so we'll see how often we see cases like this. And finally, the atypical porcine pestivirus that was described in 2015 um, in, a, in a PERS study, actually, at the time that it was described by Ben House, um, he didn't know that it could cause any disease or, or, or that it was associated with any disease. Um, it was uh, found to be apparently widespread in the U.S. Uh, but since then, there has been two reports of this uh, virus associated with, clinic, with congenital tremors. One um, described and published by Arruda in, in the USA, and one recently uh, in Germany, although I'm not completely sure or I don't know exactly what the um, degree of homology between these two viruses is, but, the, but it is described as a typical porcine pestivirus in their publication, in the German publication. There is a recent case now, in, not in um, congenital tremors, but in older pigs, in growing pigs, of a U.S. case associated with this virus as well. Um, so this is uh, fairly recent. And I don't have a lot of information about this particular case, but, but apparently it was associated with uh, tremors in, in pigs, and it caused, or it, in this particular case, there was high mortality. So again, I don't know very much about this one, but um, in general, it looks like it's, a, like it's a different picture from what we have seen with the PERS cases, the Tesho virus cases, the, um, and the Sapelo virus case that could be more similar. So this has been... You know, uh, we've been talking about this in the last uh, months or, or, or year, year and a half, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that, that really, um, when you put together a list of differentials, this would be um, very hard to differentiate uh, from the other ones. <laughs>